I want to review what I went over with the English Revolution and just do a condensed version of that here. Um, so we see the, the arc uh, of, of those events, because that'll set us up for the next section of things that I want to do. So we have, um, and I'm just focusing on this latter part, um, looking at the English Revolution per se, not the Reformation before. Okay, we're setting that aside. But um, so we have Charles I, who's trying to push this, this um, divine right of kings idea, the long parliament. Uh, well, he had, he had ruled for 11 years personally without the parliament as a totally absolute autocratic monarch and the long parliament gets called up in order to address uh, funding the bishops war and they set in place and sort of and, and twist Charles's arm to put in an act of parliament so that um, parliament cannot be dissolved unless it dissolves itself and taking away one of the prerogatives the arbitrary prerogatives of the monarchy and uh, and then of course uh, the, the English Civil War ensues. Charles is ultimately executed. And in the midst of that, there's this uh, military purge of parliament. So we get the rump parliament, which no longer has the House of Lords. So nobility is getting pushed out of, out of the equation. And in essence, we have a republic that's being run by commoners, not by a monarch and not by nobility. And uh, that's quite a revolution from what had occurred in previous centuries, as I've talked about extensively in the past. So the Commonwealth is that republic that exists in this time period. And uh, at first, it's a parliamentary ruled uh, republic, which functions fairly well, but surprisingly um, well, because parliamentary business is messy business. So Cromwell gets, gets uh, frustrated and impatient with the uh, rump parliament and, and dissolves them, okay, uh, through a military coup. And then, you know, he and his compatriots come up with the instrument of government, which is the first written constitution of England. And uh, he rules under that document. And then towards the end of his life, then there's another uh, written constitution, the humble petition and advice. And, uh, and that reinstu reinstitutes uh, an upper chamber above the House of Commons. So it's, and, and even in the first draft includes a monarchy for Cromwell, but he rejects that. But nonetheless, we get this upper house. And so this is an avenue for the nobility to start getting into that upper house. And of course, in the process of this Cromwell, and I don't think I emphasized this before, Cromwell is creating new nobility. He's creating uh, new uh, baron, uh, barons uh, within the peerage. So a lot of the later nobles after this point are actually newly minted nobil nobility from the protectorate era. So we see that there's kind of this reversion once Cromwell's in control, he kind of wants to create a new nobility, okay? Um, but he does resist the worst uh, features of it. And Parliament does retain some control over you know, that personal rule. But when that all falls apart, because there's no successor to Cromwell, and it was so, it was in fact very much based on his personal charisma. Okay, it falls apart. And then people are like, we're, we're done with that. And we want to go back to the monarchy. And Cromwell was pretty heavy handed and very militaristic. He was a military general. So he was trying to run the country in some ways like a military operation with too much rigidity and regimentation and austerity. You know, that's kind of the word is austerity. And um, for a military man, okay, austerity is fine, but for normal people, 
it's horrible. And, um, and so they want to return to the monarchy and Charles II is kind of the, the perfect character for this. Um, he is very enlightened in a certain way, but he is Catholic. Um, but he's known again as the Merry Monarch because he enjoyed, you know, the baroqueness of, of the idea of the monarchy and really played that up and tried to make England proud of itself and maybe just have a breath of fresh air. Uh, but in the midst of this, he's also trying to regain now, you know, reinstate nobility, reinstate Roman Catholicism, reinstate uh, absolute monarchy. And through a series of maneuvers through these various parliaments, he ultimately is able to consolidate enough actual power, you know, apart from what was on paper, actual power. And part of that is because parliament gave him a lot of money to work with. Um, he was able to then rule as an absolute autocratic monarch for a few years at the end of his reign before he died. So we have a total restoration of the absolute monarchy and Charles II here now uh, is sort of enjoying the kind of monarchy that Charles I only dreamed about. Okay. Um, and then James uh, comes onto the throne. Uh, he has the loyal parliament, uh, which also gives him a lot of funds to work with. And, um, and then he's able to have uh, again, although on paper it wasn't supposed to be an absolute monarchy, he was able to maneuver things into a situation where he had autocratic absolute rule for a few years. Okay, so that was a total defeat of the Republican Commonwealth that had existed before. You know, you, they rub the uh, Re Re Republican spirit was able to get the Commonwealth into place. And then it's totally undone by the restoration. Uh, but then we have William of, of Orange out there who needs England strategically and has been playing a long game, uh, is a Republican, and uh, to some extent, uh, uh, as far as nobility go, uh, but is uh, largely a Republican and is largely a a Protestant and fits the bill, you know, for the kind of leader that will um, do what now the House of Lords and the House of Commons both want together because they don't want this absolute monarchy uh, business. They want a parliament and they want to be able to uh, protect themselves uh, in relationship to the monarchy. They don't want to live under absolute autocratic rule. And so William of Orange comes in and and just fixes things uh, very quickly. And um, Parliament is able to negotiate with William initially to get things somewhat in a form, the form of a parliamentary monarchy, but especially as William of Orange gets older and is approaching death, then he's able and, and willing to relinquish uh, relinquish the whole notion of an absolute monarchy and the, that's ex especially precipitated by the likely outcome that um, that the uh, that so Sophia of Hanover um, is going to be is going to be uh, the next in line after Anne. And so we're, they're going to have a foreigner on the throne who's very foreign. Uh, William of Orange was not so foreign, uh, but the prospects in the future are looking like we're going to have a foreign king. And that's, you know, from the perspective of Parliament, that's, that's not great. And, um, but I think um, William understands that. And so they, they come to a final settlement, the act of settlement of 1701, and that gets the parliamentary monarchy on a solid footing. 
and then Queen Anne rules uh, as the last, uh, uh, the last of the Stuart uh, monarchs, um, uh, and and then we move on to a whole new phase of English history. But in this new phase, now the the parliamentary monarchy really sets in, and so that's what I want to talk about next. Okay, I'll see you there.